biographies of objects. My name is Gisela Carbonell, and I am the curator at the Cornell Fine Arts Museum at Rollins College. Thank you for joining us today. Our speakers are Professors Zach Gilmore and Robert Vanderpoppen. Zach Gilmore is an assistant professor of anthropology and program coordinator in archaeology at Rollins College. He received his PhD in anthropology from the University of Florida in 2014 and has been at Rollins since 2016. Zach directs the Central Florida Archaeological Field School program and curates the collections of the Rollins College Archaeology Lab. His research centers on reconstructing the social histories of pre-Columbian Native American societies of Florida and the broader American Southeast. Zach's work in the field, the lab, and the classroom is guided by an explicitly critical approach to human history and a strong belief in the power of the past to help shape our present and our future. Storied Objects began as a collaborative course project involving members of SAC's fall 2019 public archaeology class, the Cornell Fine Arts Museum, and the Olin Library Archives. Professor Robert van der Poppen is the Associate Professor of Classical Arts and Archaeology in the Department of Art and Art History at Rollins College and serves as Program coordina Coordinator in Classical Studies. Robert has over a decade of experience excavating with various projects in Tuscany, Italy, including acting as the co-field director for the Mugello Valley Archaeological Project, Foggio Cola Field School. Robert studies the intersection of native and Roman material culture in the context of the expansion of the Roman Empire in Italy. His research and teaching often applies new digital methodologies to traditional archaeological questions and his work of storied objects stemmed from a collaboration with students in his digital methods in art history class in the spring of 2020. Thank you for being with us today. This program is in conjunction with the upcoming exhibition, Storied Objects, Relics and Tales from the Thomas R. Baker Museum, which opens at the Cornell Fine Arts Museum on September 18th, and of which Zach and Robert are the curators. General support for this event is provided by Art Bridges. After the presentation, there will be a Q&A session, so please feel free to submit your questions or comments via the chat box. We'll get to those right after the presentation. Welcome, Zach and Robert. It's great to have you here with us today and to talk about this project. Great to be here today. Hi, Zach. Welcome. Can you hear OK? I think we lost the audio there for a second. Um, I'm sorry. I believe I was muted. <laughs> I hear you fine. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hi, Zach, and welcome. <laughs> it's good to have you for this conversation. So to get started, this is, uh, this is a project that involves many different components. It involves faculty, a museum collection, another museum, um, and a lot of uh, different moving parts and collaborations. So to get started, to get started, Tell us a little bit about the origin of this project and how did you first learn about the origin, uh, about the original Rollins Museum? Um, sure. So this project really originated shortly after I arrived at Rollins in, in 2016. Um, one of the ways I occupied my free time at that point was uh, going through a lot of the, uh, the really extensive archives and, and archaeological collections that we have in our archaeology lab. And, and Cornell Social Sciences. And one of the things I ran across was a binder that had been put together by one of my predecessors, Marilyn Stewart, uh, who was an archaeologist at Rollins who retired around 2005. And I, I ran across a binder labeled Baker Museum. And I started flipping through, and, and this binder was full of, of photographs of, of really spectacular artifacts from all over the world. And I knew by that point that, that these artifacts weren't in our collections in the archaeology lab anymore. And so I dug a little deeper into it, and I found some of uh, Dr. Stewart's notes and, and archival records that she had put together uh, referencing a, a historic museum that, that used to exist at Rollins called uh, the Baker Museum. And uh, yeah, so the slide that, that, Rollin, or that, that uh, Robert just, just put up on the screen um, shows 
a museum that existed at Rollins even before the Baker Museum. So shortly after Rollins was founded, uh, an, uh, a, a museum was established that was mostly a uh, natural science museum. It contained uh, primarily uh, fossils and botanical specimens and, and, and a lot of those sorts of things. And it existed in Knowles Hall, which was one of the first academic buildings on campus. Uh, and the, the picture the, on the, the top of the screen, uh, the building just to the left of Pinehurst is, is the original Knowles Hall. And you can see on the bottom left what, what the building uh, originally looked like. Um, all of the natural history collections were contained in this building until 19, uh, 1909 when uh, there was a devastating fire. So alarm sounded in the middle of the night and people came out and saw that Knowles Hall was in flames. And so on the bottom in the center, you can see a picture of the building actually uh, engulfed in flames. And by the next morning, uh, really nothing was left of the building. On the bottom right, you see basically a chimney standing and that was, that was everything that was left. So this was in this fire, all of the natural history collections were, were a complete loss. Um, uh, but, but more than that, uh, the, the college's science labs were all lost. Uh, the uh, business program was housed in Knowles Hall, the, the original chapel. And so this was a really devastating loss for the college. Um, and there was some question even whether Rollins could actually carry on given the, the magnitude of, 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 of the loss from this fire. Um, if we go to the next slide. So it was a loss for the, the, the entire college, but really, uh, especially for one particular individual, uh, Thomas Baker was a professor of natural science at Rollins um, from 1890 to 1911. And he was responsible primarily for putting the, the collections for the original museum together and it was also his science labs that, that were destroyed. And so he was, he was very much devastated. He got over it rather quickly though. And, and by uh, January, so the following month, uh, Dr. Baker and other leaders at Rollins had decided that they wanted to reconstitute the, the Rollins Museum. And they wanted to make it bigger and better than it had ever been. And so they basically, they sent requests to, to uh, Rollins alumni and to distinguished institutions and individuals around the country asking them for contributions of museum quality specimens. Um, on the screen here, you see a copy of one of the requests that was actually sent out. Um, it says, we are making a museum collection to replace the large and valuable one destroyed in the burning of Knowles Hall. And they're asking our friends to aid us in this work by contributing specimens of rocks, ores, well, well drillings, special clays, good road material, relics from shell heaps, crystals, mounted birds, insects, etc. anything of geological, mineralogical, and, and zoological or botanical interest. And the response to this request was really incredible. People from around the country donated objects and basically this formed the nucleus of what would become the, the Thomas Baker uh, Museum of Natural History um, on Rollins campus. Um, and grew from a small collections of objects in, in 1910 to more than 20,000 objects uh, just a few decades later. Uh, next slide. And so a new building was constructed to in part house the, uh, the, the Thomas Baker collection. Uh, that was known as Knowles Hall II. It was built uh, in the location where the Olin Library currently sits and Space was uh, made on the second floor of this building to house all of the, the Baker Museum collections. Um, and so the Baker Museum remained on Rollins campus until the 1970s when the museum had lost a lot of institutional support. There was no longer a faculty director. And so uh, Marilyn Stewart, who was hired in the 1970s, she packed up what was left of the, the Rollins or of the Baker Museum collections and moved it into storage first in uh, the Bush Science Center and then eventually to the archaeology lab and Cornell Social Sciences uh, when that was built. And so we had this, this really incredible museum with uh, collections that uh, span five continents and more than 5,000 years of human history that sort of bounced around campus and eventually ended up in storage uh, until it was uh, a permanent home was found for it in, in 2003. Uh, when it was moved to the, the Cornell Fine Arts Museum.
So it's, it's fascinating that the initial phase of research and of uncovering information was really centered on the collectors, right? The donors who, who gave these collections, which is a little different sometimes than research for other types of projects. So I wonder if you can expand a little bit on that and also uh, talk about and share with us how your approaches are different and how do you work as a team because your fields are related, but they may have different methodologies. You study different regions of the world. So how is it um, to work together um, and how to complement each other to make this, this project happen? Yeah, uh, if I can this and then pass it over to Zach. It's, uh, it's been completely unusual. I, I joked with a, my mentor in a conversation I had with him back a, a few weeks ago that I'm usually researching things and people that are 2,000, 3,000 years old and um, dealing with modern donors to an institution in the 20th century feels awfully close to stalking for me. Uh, just a, a completely different experience. Uh, but these donors were so intertwined with the process of rebuilding this museum and a passion for Rollins and a passion for sharing the experiences that they had had with the campus community, that it seemed a natural way to approach the, the material. And some of these biographies are absolutely stunning and, and spectacular. Uh, I won't give too much away if I say that when folks come to the exhibition, um, they're gonna meet individuals that were running field schools uh, in the Middle East, acting as consuls of the US, uh, they're going to meet archaeologists who came up the, uh, the St. John's River in a riverboat. Uh, and they're going to meet all sorts of characters that interwoven and intertwine themselves with the experience of Rollins. Uh, I think Zach and I do bring a little bit of a different approach to the material. Uh, the one thing we have going for us is we have the advantage of both of us being trained as archaeologists. Uh, Archaeology is one of these weird disciplines that exists in nearly every department in the social sciences and even in the arts sometimes on a campus. Uh, so we share some similar training there, but I think uh, Zach can speak particularly about his interest in the archives and his interest in the, the public facing portion of the project. And uh, I'd like to highlight that with my students, we were really interested in building the context of the journey that led these donors to both collect the items, but then also to donate the items to the, uh, the institution. So for us, it was about taking not the item as a whole, but rather thinking about it within its historical context, both in terms of when the item was used originally, but then how that donor interacted with it and how the object fits into the story of the, the donation to the museum as well. Sure. Um... I agree with everything uh, Robert just said there. I mean, there are slightly different approaches, but uh, there's also a significant amount of overlap and sort of complementary specialty. So the collection uh, is, is really eclectic and really broad. And so I realized pretty quickly when I started unpacking boxes and looking at the scope of the collection that it was beyond just my expertise. And so the fact that, um, we have a lot of, uh, of artifacts in the in the collection that come from the Middle East and from Egypt. Um, that's in part of the world that, that Robert is, is, is much better versed in than I am. Um, there are also a lot of Native American objects and Mesoamerican uh, pre-Columbian objects. And so I had a little bit of a better handle on that. So, so geographically, I feel like our skill sets really complement each other. And then the fact that we're focusing primarily on the, the provenance of these objects I think is, is one thing that we also sort of come together with. So the, the idea of, of looking at the, the social lives of, of things, of artifacts, is, a, is an approach that's been pretty popular in both art history and in, in anthropological archeology span for, for quite some time. And so uh, just getting to, to tell the story of these individual objects from their original cultural context all the way up to their arrival at Rollins in the early 20th century is something that we, we both, I think, latched onto pretty quickly. I think also, you know, and it's fascinating to hear you talk about how you work together and how you approach it from your from your fields and your experience and your knowledge. But also for us as a museum and as an institution, you know, because we are a teaching museum that we have this opportunity to have expertise from different fields come together to help us, right? Um, also uncover the stories of these objects so that we can teach with them, we can show them to our community and share them with our visitors. 
Um, so in that context, one of the things that makes this exhibition special um, and that characterizes the type of collaborative work here at Rollins is for students to have hands-on experience and faculty student engagement. So how were students involved in this exhibition and how it worked having students in, in, in courses that you were both teaching at different times and specializing in different topics and then bringing them together to work on this exhibition so that they gain experience um, hands-on researching uh, the objects, the donors, and then ultimately helping to put together this exhibition. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Uh, I think when we started this endeavor, there was an idea that we were going to have to involve lots of stakeholders and we were really excited about get, getting students involved. Uh, and then we all got sent home in March and that entire process became incredibly more difficult uh, because in some senses we were doing research away from the institution without access to some of the, the monographs and things that we would normally have. And what made this project so exciting was the way that people across campus came together in order to help essentially salvage what could have been a, a disastrous experience of being away from the physical museum, being away from the objects. Um, and I can't say enough about two groups of folks who helped students stay plugged into this project. And the first of those groups uh, are the Olin Library staff, uh, particularly Wen Xin Zhang, uh, Rachel Walton, and Darla Moore, who all work in the archives. Uh, they were instrumental in maintaining access to the archives. They were instrumental in finding ways to get access to research monographs for students uh, when we had to do everything digital. So finding digital versions or purchasing digital versions so that students could write some really great research papers. Uh, and this also drew in a, a little bit of Gisela's museum staff as well, because not being in front of the collections, uh, it meant that Austin Reeves uh, wound up having to photograph some of the, the objects for us so that we had great images for the students to work from. Uh, it meant that Adam Levine had to think of creative ways to get us into the storeroom. Uh, we had to do things like do live feeds from the, the storeroom sometimes or, or from the uh, print study room in order to keep students engaged in all of the primary material. So to get back directly to the students, we engaged the students in two separate classes that folded out in two phases. Uh, I'll turn it over to Zach for a moment to talk about his public archaeology class in the fall, and then uh, I'll be back with you guys to talk about the digital methods and art history class that took place in the spring. All right, so at the very um, sort of ground level, at the very initial stages of this, of uh, planning this, uh, this exhibition, I involved uh, my public archaeology class in, in fall of 2019, and it was really a challenging project. I asked a lot of students because at this point we were still figuring out what what the collection was. You know, um, we hadn't even opened all the boxes yet um, uh, to, to see everything that was included in, in the Baker Museum collection. So. Uh, the course, uh, Public Archaeology, is geared toward, you know, engaging the public through archaeological data, um, through artifacts, through, through public presentations, those sorts of things. And so um, museum exhibitions are obviously a really effective way of doing that. But first, we needed to, to really document uh, the, the collection. And so throughout the fall 2019 semester, uh, several students were working weekly at uh, the Cornell Fine Arts Museum, um, helping to create an inventory of the, of, of the collection, uh, completing condition reports um, initially, and then eventually trying to narrow this, this group of hundreds of objects down to a more manageable size, you know, that might be included in an exhibition. Um, so, Many students were involved in that. Uh, a smaller group of students was working um, at the same time uh, at the Olin Library Archives with Wen Chen and, and Darla and Rachel, and really digging into the history of the museum, tracking down leads on individual donors, um, and really trying to, to build a, a, an archival record of the museum that we would be able to, to sort of fill in the gaps in our knowledge and, and, and really make a, a more robust uh, exhibition with. So, um, I can't speak highly enough about the efforts of the, of the students in my public archaeology class and how important they were to the, the, the final product that, that the exhibition uh, became. 
Yeah, I would echo that, that uh, the students were really the driving force in dealing with one of the particular donors in the show, uh, one that we won't talk about today, uh, Charles McCormick Reeve. The students in the ARH 315 class went through the other archive. So one of the things that we discovered in all of this was that there were archival materials in Olin Library that related to this collection, uh, but that CFAM itself had some of the documents. Sometimes they overlapped, sometimes they were unique. Uh, and so the students in the ARH 315 class went through all of the Cornell Fine Arts Museum archives related to these materials. Uh, and then they all got sent out to work on a couple of different objects. Uh, most students had two objects and they produced essentially um, research based web pages on each one of the, the each one of the artifacts in the collection. Uh, documenting both uh, how the object was used, how it was made, what its original context was, uh, but then also taking a look at when our donor was present and acquired the object. So what was going on at the point when the object was acquired and uh, then tracing it as well through the donor's biography into how it comes into Rollins collection. Uh, and I have to say, I, I too was absolutely blown away not only that students were able to do this kind of firsthand research, but at the way that they got excited about it. And uh, it seemed like no hurdle that got thrown in their way kept them down. Uh, not having access to monographs, not having access readily to the material. Uh, they worked with all these partners on campus to do a phenomenal job. And one of the things I'm most excited about is for that donor, Charles McCormick Reeve, uh, we'll have a, a website that will go live at the same time as the, the museum opening that will document some of these students' research uh, and will give a, a far deeper exploration of some of the individual objects uh, in a way that we can't really do in the, the exhibition as a whole because we're focused on the donors and at the donor level uh, rather than at the individual level. So uh, yeah, I, I think our students were intrigued by the mystery of this lost collection and they got excited and uh, archival work and artifact work is amazing because every new discovery is like a light bulb going off and that sort of experience of inspiration and finding that right document that sheds light on something uh, is just a, a phenomenal process to engage in and it's what what keeps scholars going i am uh, all of us at the museum we're so excited about this project uh, you know this is really uncharted territory a lot of these objects um, that were in our um, in our vault, you know, I had not seen before. So now I'm seeing them for the first time um, through the lens of this project of uncovering the stories of these objects. Um, and also, I want to emphasize the importance of of, of your students um, collaborating in this project, but also of the work that you both have led in this project. That will, you know, this is the legacy that is part now of. CFAM story and of the collection of the museum that really um, have happened with your guidance and your knowledge um, and your, your own original research on these objects. So I'm very excited to see what the exhibition will look like once it's um, installed, of course, and we'll have uh, several other opportunities through the semester to look at specific objects in the gallery and to talk more in depth about them. Um, but getting back to the discussion of the process of, of researching and um, can you share with us what were some of the most challenging aspects of this project? You talked a little bit about, you know, the challenges of accessing materials and, and not being physically on campus. What were some of the other challenging aspects of, of the project getting ready for the exhibition and how did you and your student, uh, student teams address them? One of the, the most challenging aspects I found was, was the breadth of the collection. Um, there are objects from, from around the world, and I don't know about Robert, but I'm not aware of any archaeologist who has the expertise uh, to really command knowledge of, 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 of all of these different cultures and time periods. Um, and so the, our student collaborators were, I think, really essential in sort of helping track down leads on some of the individual objects and in doing a little bit of research about their background. It also required though, um, I know I reached out to archeologists at, at UCF who uh, specialized in, in Maya artifacts and had them you know, come in and, and provide some information. I reached out to, to colleagues at the Arizona State Museum about some of our, our the, the Southwestern objects in, in, in the collections. And so 
I think we brought in colleagues from a lot of different places and, and with a lot of expert, different expertise um, to, to help overcome that. But it is pretty daunting uh, to, to, to see a collection of this size and of this scope and, and try to, to boil it down um, into a, to a manageable sort of uh, single ex exhibition. Yeah, I think that was one of the, the major challenges. And in some ways that was facilitated by asking students to become experts in one small sort of micro area and, and time period. And they really rose to the challenge to read the major monographs, uh, to get familiar with the material culture and to become that expert, uh, at least a little bit in the individual artifacts that they were researching and that they were associated with. It's almost like it's almost like doing detective work, right? There's there's that excitement of of doing something and uncovering something that is not uh, publicly known yet. Um, so it must be very exciting for them and a very important experience for sure as undergraduate students. Um, there must have been surprising findings in your research, um, you know, beyond the fact that you uncovered the the, the story of the collection. But were there anything? Uh, was there anything? totally unexpected that you have uncovered in the process or any anecdotes or specifics that you can share with us? This might be a good opportunity to, to talk about Edgar Banks, Robert. Yeah, you know. I, I was thinking the exact same thing. Uh, so one of our toners, Edgar Banks, was an individual that uh, has a, a really sort of wild history and, and life story. And the thing that shocked me about Edgar Banks was um, how Edgar Banks got permission to engage in his first excavation. Uh, Edgar Banks uh, studied politics uh, as well as ancient Mesopotamian languages. And when he graduated, uh, he figured that the fastest way to get an archeological permit was go to go into the US Foreign Service. Uh, so he applied for a position as a consul uh, within the Ottoman Empire. He was appointed as a consul in uh, Istanbul, and he used an assassination attempt, a foiled assassination attempt on the U.S. vice consul in Beirut as uh, a leverage point. Uh, and supposedly there was a, a U.S. fleet quickly approaching the Ottoman Empire after this foiled assassination attempt uh, that led him to put pressure on the Ottoman bureaucracy to grant him a permit for the site that he had been looking to excavate. Uh, so you've got an international incident that sparks then a, a permit for an excavation and gets banks into the field originally. Uh, and he, he sort of is that kind of gentleman adventurer that becomes really large uh, in the, the consciousness of early 20th century archaeology with figures like T.W. Lawrence. Uh, but Banks himself is there a little bit earlier. And uh, when Banks excavates, Banks works at a place called ADAB. Uh, he gets his permit and he's working on an excavation that was funded by the Rockefeller family and was associated with the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago. And at this site, uh, ADAB, he winds up doing a, a, a large scale excavation, uh, but things go sour in that excavation. And he winds up leaving the, the institute. He winds up leaving the excavation after just a couple of years at its head. And Banks decided to make it his life, life's work to engage audiences around the US in uh, knowledge about the earliest writing systems and what he saw as this fundamental culture in the, uh, in the Middle East in the area that we refer to archeologically as Mesopotamia. And so he traveled when he got back to the US, all over the US, and he was connected to the antiquities market and was purchasing small cuneiform tablets, like the one that we see at the bottom of the slide here, uh, written in ancient Sumerian. And most of them are documenting uh, simple accounting transactions. But he wanted these tablets and knowledge of these Near Eastern languages to be part of the curriculum of colleges and universities. So he engaged in a speaking tour. And when he would speak, he would usually bring a couple of tablets with him. And he would offer those tablets up to the institution that he was speaking at. And uh, he seeded collections from Utah to Montana to Harvard uh, to Rollins College. Uh, Banks had developed a, a friendship with uh, first Professor Grover. And then later on, uh, he developed a, a friendship with uh, 
with Hugh McCain himself, when the Banks family came back to Florida, he had bought Orange Groves, and he had also invested in a movie company. We know he was a movie consultant to Cecil B. DeMille and was actually an archaeological consultant in some of these uh, big budget films that DeMille was doing uh, on biblical epics. And uh, when the family got in trouble financially uh, due to the depression, due to the failure of the movie industry in Florida, uh, and also due to some frosts that happened in the citrus crops, uh, their daughter was at Rollins at that moment. And uh, Daphne, who was at Rollins, wound up needing a, a loan to help her get through her college experience. And so uh, he worked out a deal whereby he got a loan for Daphne to finish up her, her studies at Rollins. Daphne eventually graduated. Uh, and when he eventually passed away, his wife, Minya Banks, uh, had remembered Rollins' kindness in helping Daphne to complete her degree in this moment where the, the family had experienced this financial trouble. And um, Minya wound up donating the remainder of Edgar Banks's antiquities, his own personal collection, to the Baker Museum. Uh, and this was largely due to the fact that the family had maintained this intense friendship with Hugh McCain, who was a professor of art at Rollins uh, during the time when Daphne Banks had been here. And uh, I want to highlight one object today that I want to focus on, and that's this little uh, cone up to the right-hand top of the slide here. And it's seemingly uh, an innocuous object. It's essentially a spike that someone would pound into a bitumen or a, a resin matrix on a column or on the wall of a temple. And these were used for recording official documents. And uh, the temple was the place where people came together and because they both recognized the validity of the god, uh, anything that was written down and was stored in the temple meant that it was binding. Uh, if not legally binding, it was spiritually binding for the, the people that engaged in the, the act of planting that cone inside the temple. And uh, we have an example from Banks that was acquired by Professor Grover, who's one of these legendary figures at Rollins. His title was Professor of the Book. Uh, and it's significant because it's one of the earliest treaties of alliance that we have recorded anywhere in world history. And so uh, the cuneiform marks on the cone, the little wedge-shaped marks, read roughly, and I'm using Banks' original translation here, to Inini and to the owner of the house of Inini. Uh, and Inini is the god. And to Mena, and he's one of the kings, the ruler over Lagash, has built the house of Inini. In other words, he built the temple, their beloved house, and the place he has promised. And to Mena, that king again, the man who built the house of Inini, his god, is the divine Dunmush. We don't know what Dunmush means. Uh, if we go on to the second portion of the translation, this is where it gets really exciting. On that day, Entemena, the ruler of Lagash, Lagash is a, a city in Mesopotamia, has made Lugol Kineshududu a brother. This is one of those wonderful uh, names that we get sometimes in cuneiform. And we know from the Sumerian king lists that he was the king of a city called Uruk. And so making him a brother is the phrase that one uses for a treaty of alliance. So here we have in a collection in central Florida by way of uh, a diplomat turned archeologist turned movie consultant, one of the earliest treaties of alliance recorded. Um, and there is nothing like bringing students into a room and showing them essentially a 5,000 year old document uh, that speaks to the complexity of the world and how far back that complexity stretches in the human story. That is absolutely fascinating. And it's, it's just the, the, the background, the story that makes these objects, of course, so much more special and, and seeing them having this knowledge, it just opens up uh, uh, new perspectives on considering how these objects, why these objects are important still today. Why, why do we need to, to know these things, to open that door to see how historical events connect with the present, what we can learn from them. Um, and especially as we think about, um, you know, telling stories using objects that are stored in museums, I wonder how many more maybe we have, how many more objects like this are in museum vaults all over the world that we don't know about yet, that have not been studied yet. This is fascinating, Robert. Thank you so much for sharing 
um, for, for sharing so much about this particular object. Zach, was there um, anything that you wanted to share in terms of surprising findings for you? Um, one of the, the most surprising facts that, that, that we uncovered, I think, um, was that one of the most significant early donors to the, the, the Baker Museum was the Smithsonian Institution. Um, and it sort of gets to, to one specific uh, piece of the Smithsonian Institution called the, the Bureau of American Ethnology, which was formed in 1879 with a mission largely to collect information on Native American tribes around the country, which it was widely assumed and, and erroneously, of course, at that point, that, that many of these cultures would disappear entirely. And so the Smithsonian hired a bunch of anthropologists and archaeologists and, and sent them uh, across, around the country to collect information on different Native American tribes and also to collect artifacts related to these cultures that could be preserved in perpetuity at the Smithsonian once the cultures themselves were gone. Um, it turns out, though, that, that the, the, the Smithsonian was too successful in this and that the, the collections began to outgrow the space that they had for them. And so in the early 1900s, a tradition developed of the Smithsonian donating what they viewed as uh, redundant objects to colleges and museums and, and, and even individuals around the country, usually in exchange for political or financial considerations. So one of these donations was made in 1926 to the Baker Museum at the urging of then U.S. Senator Duncan Fletcher, who was a senator from Florida. We have a copy of the letter he wrote to the Smithsonian, sort of you know, greasing the wheels and, and making this donation happen. And the donation included 32 objects, uh, mostly uh, North American ethnographic uh, objects um, from, from Native American tribes uh, across the continent. And I just uh, included a few of those here. Um, several of the objects that were donated by the Smithsonian had been collected by a really important uh, early anthropologist named Matilda Cox Stevenson, who you can see uh, on the bottom of this slide. She was the very first anthropologist, very first woman anthropologist employed by the U.S. government. Um, she was hired by the Bureau of American Ethnology in 1879. She went on to become the first president of the Women's Anthropological Society of America. And in 1879, she traveled to the American Southwest and specifically to Zuni Pueblo, um, where she would end up spending uh, several years and writing a really influential uh, ethnography. And she collected a, a massive collection of Zuni pottery while she was there. And one of the objects she collected is pictured here. It's a, a, a small owl effigy um, that was produced in the 1870s, um, probably um, as a trade object. So this was shortly after the railroad was completed through the American Southwest. And so the, the market with uh, European and, and American traders for, for Native American goods was, was surging. And so one of the things that the Zuni were producing at that point were these little owl figurines. Um, and it turns out this, this ended up being a really important form in Zuni culture and one that they still make today. And this is one of the, the earliest uh, examples of, of these owl figurines uh, that we're aware of. Um, just one other quick example, the, the uh, headdress on the right um, was collected by a, a U.S. Army officer and also a collector of, of antiquities and purchased by the Bureau of American Ethnology um, in the 1880s. And it was intended to be displayed at the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, a fair that displayed a number of, of large collections of, of Native American artifacts and also Native American people, sort of uh, horrifyingly. Um, we don't know whether this object actually made it into the exhibition at the World's Fair, but we knew, do know that that was uh, the intent when it was purchased. So um, each of the 32 objects in the, the Smithsonian donation are, have sort of the, this, one of these really cool stories um, that connect the, the original Native American cultures to, you know, uh, an important scientist or, or government official in the 19th century and eventually back to Rollins College. And so a few of these are included in the exhibition, um, but there, there are dozens of others that we sort of had to, to weed out um, that we just couldn't fit um, in, in a single exhibition. Thank you so much for, for that, Zach. So I have one last um, question, and then um, we see that there are some questions from 
uh, people who are uh, watching and attending this event that I want to have a chance for you to address. But um, if you summarize um, very briefly, what is it that you think or you would like visitors to take away from the exhibition? What would it be? I think from my perspective, um, it's the notion that objects themselves uh, begin to tell us not only about one time period, the time period in which they were made and used, but that rather and that contact with people, the object tells us about when the object was acquired, the piece of the story. And that's the piece of the story about how an object ends up in a museum collection. And interactions, uh, all of them are laden with, all of them are laden with interactions and personalities. And uh, we're really talking about the history of people here, not just the donors whose pictures show up on the walls, uh, but the folks that manufactured and used these objects initially as well. And the only thing I would add to that is that uh, I would hope that people would take uh, a, a a greater appreciation for the, the uniqueness of Rollins as an institution, um, because I can't imagine this collection coming together, all of the, the amazing cast of characters and, and people and places and objects are sort of intersecting at Rollins in the early 20th century. I can't imagine this taking place anywhere else, certainly in Florida, and, and really almost anywhere else, you know, anywhere. And so uh, the fact that it did happen at Rollins is a really cool piece of institutional history that seems to have been uh, forgotten to some extent. Absolutely, and it's, it definitely makes it uh, very special. And again, it opens the door to future uh, discoveries and, to, and for further research on, on some of these objects and, and donors as well. So we have one question here from our director, from Anna Heller. Um, she asked, alongside all these artifacts, do specimens from the Natural History Museum still exist in storage? And if so, are they used in teaching at all? That's a really good question. And so the bulk of the, the Baker Museum collections were actually natural history specimens and not cultural ones. And so we're highlighting the archeological materials because that's what we're interested in, and also because that's sort of what remains. Most of the natural history collections were donated to the Florida Museum of Natural History when, uh, when the Bush Science Center was renovated. And so at that point in time, there still were huge collections of, of fossils and insects and, uh, and minerals and, and other natural history items that were donated to the Florida Mu Museum of Natural History in Gainesville and also to some local organizations who are gonna use those objects in teaching. But as far as I'm aware, none of that, or very, very little of the natural history um, part of the collection still exists on campus. Thank you. And um, there's another question here from Michael. How many objects total will be in the exhibition? I think there, I think there are around 70 to 75 total objects. Um, some of them are really tiny. And so it may not feel like that many, but I think there are around 70 to 75 total that are going to be included. That's out of, I think I, I looked at the records quickly. I think there are around 700 objects left in the collection. Um, and so about 10% of it we're going to, we'll, we'll have on display. Okay. Thank you. And another question here. Yeah. Um, and a lot of these. Go ahead. Go ahead, Robert. Uh, a lot of these objects, first time that they've been on display is really exciting. Uh, there's another question about the Smithsonian's contribution. Was it separate from the original influx after the fire? It was. It, so the Smithsonian collection happened in 1926. So it was um, well, 15 years, 15, 17 years later um, after the fire. And so um, there was an initial request for donations that went out in 1910. So just a month after the fire happened. Um, but the, um, the desire for donations and the desire to grow the museum continued on after that. And so we have lists of donations for almost every year for the next few decades after the, the Baker Museum was established. And um, hundreds of objects are coming in every year and some really amazing objects. Um, and so the Smithsonian donation came in in 1926, but at that point, the, the, the 
uh, the museum accessions were, were still going strong. Um, we have a question here that uh, it's a great question, and I think it's, it's important um, to address. It, it's from Patricia, and it says, did the research of the objects and the donors reveal objects that by today's standards, we would think should not have been removed from their original location? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So much has changed in terms of antiquities laws that uh, in particular, I'll, I'll give you the example of, of Charles Reeves, who we'll see in the exhibition as a whole. Um, he was a chipper. Um, he engaged in this late 19th, early 20th century phenomenon of chipping small pieces of major artifacts away. Uh, for example, uh, shells from the, the matrix of the stone in the Sphinx and things like this. Um, stuff that today you'd, you'd literally be arrested for. Uh, but met the standards of, of his day and the collecting practices of his day. So uh, the vast majority of this material being from uh, other countries than the U.S. and uh, no longer would you be able to remove that from its country of origin after the, the UNESCO Treaty on Cultural Heritage. Uh, all of the, the objects that come into this exhibition exist largely, at least in terms of Reeve and in terms of banks, uh, in an era where there were very, very different standards than today's standards. And maybe Zach can speak about some of the, the New World materials. Yeah, I, th I think you're right. I think almost any of the objects from other countries, it would be difficult to, to bring them in um, today, right? So any, any, any of the artifacts that have crossed international borders, there would be a lot of permitting required. There'd be a lot of permissions. Um, thankfully, um, in terms of the Native American objects uh, that are a part of the collection, we didn't have to deal um, with, with objects uh, that would fall under the purview of NAGPRA and uh, there, were, there were no human remains uh, remaining in the collection. We know that there originally were because of some of the object lists that we have, um, but, but that, that did not become a part of the issue. But um, the Mayan artifacts, for example, um, a lot of the, the ancient, uh, like uh, West uh, Mexican artifacts, all of those countries now have really um, strict restrictions on the removal of antiquities from their, their countries of origin. So I think assembling a collection like this today would be, would be near impossible, and, and for good reason. But we've just become much more sensitive to, to keeping objects in, in their original locations. I have here uh, a, a great uh, comment from Jennifer Cavanaugh about um, uh, perhaps connecting uh, some creative writing students to the objects and stories that, that you have gathered and uncovered. Um, uh, she says, I could, I could see some really interesting stories being inspired by these artifacts. I absolutely agree. It would be really interesting to see how the writing about the objects can be different when it's writing that's coming from maybe an art historian or an, or an anthropologist versus perhaps um, someone in creative writing and, and see what, what stories can be uh, developed based on the, on the objects. Um, was the uh, cause of the fire ever determined? So, no, not definitively. So there was speculation that it was faulty wiring, uh, but nobody ever found out for sure. Um, and it turns out it could have been much worse. So only a few months before, um, Pinehurst had been sort of piped in and had its own water source, and that's the only thing that, that kept Pinehurst from going down at the same time as, as the museum. And so I think there was an investigation, but it was left sort of inconclusive. Okay, I have a couple more questions in our last few minutes of the virtual conversations. Uh, we have a question from Richard. Any insight as to why the ancient alliance artifact was shaped like a cone? Yeah, uh, these documents that were meant to be preserved were meant to be pushed uh, almost like a spike into the wall or column of a temple. And that conical shape makes it really easy to, to insert them into that matrix of a, a material, um, either mud brick or a material called bitumen, which is a, a sort of naturally occurring tar. Um, and so that conical shape makes them really easy to insert and make a, a permanent part of the architecture. Thank you. Um, and then probably our last question, um, 
What do you mean when you say social lives of objects? This is a question from Michael. Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, and I should have explained that better. Um, <laughs> so there's been a, a trend that really started in the 1980s. There was a book called The Social Life of Things that was really influential across uh, a, n a number of different disciplines. And it was basically a recognition that objects, artifacts have lives that are similar to people, right? They're, they're born when they're manufactured. They, they enter into and leave different relationships. They move across the landscape. They, they can actually uh, participate in certain events. And then eventually they, they, they have sort of a symbolic death, right? They end up as a part of the archeological record. Um, and so like thinking about the biographies of things is sort of a methodological decision. It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, an approach where you follow the, the provenance of a particular object as it moves through different contexts. And in doing so, you can make connections between different people in different places in different time periods that you might never otherwise. And so you end up with these really rich narratives that are built around the objects themselves. And so in this case, um, we had such great information on the original cultural significance of, of many of these artifacts, about the circumstances of their collection, about the people who donated them to the Baker Museum, and then their, their role in the Baker Museum you know, uh, itself, that it made sense to sort of approach these from a biographical perspective and to look at, at the life history of the objects rather than focusing on the, the, the just formal qualities or the aesthetics as, as, as you could also have done. And as we think about the social lives of these objects, there's a question here from Anna that I think it's a good one to wrap up and think about our ongoing conversation about this collection that we will be having throughout this semester and beyond. Um, and she asked if, if you have any thoughts about how we can include this fantastic part of the collection more in the museum, in our museum offerings, making it more available for teaching as well as for the general public. And I think that's something that we want to work on and have now that we have these stories, now that we know these objects and these collectors a little bit better, we'll be uh, better positioned to start integrating some of these objects in our exhibitions um, for the benefit of our campus community and also for our visitors from elsewhere. Um, so a final question, and it's kind of a, a fun question to think about, is when is it coming out? That was a question from Michael. Um, I would love for it to be um, a documentary about this collection, a movie, and, and maybe a fictionalized um, account of, of how the um, uncovering of the storied objects came about. Any final thoughts from Robert and Zach before, before we close? Well, again, about this collection, and we've only scratched the surface, and we've only met a few of the characters that are involved. So I would highly encourage folks to um, engage with the other opportunities that there are to see this exhibition, both virtually and in person, uh, fingers crossed. And uh, there's so much more here that you'll get the opportunity to engage with. And then just a final thanks to all of our collaborators on this project, all of the folks at the, at the Olin Archives and at, at the Cornell Fine Arts Museum and all of our fantastic students. Um, it's really been a team effort putting it all together. Thank you both for your work and uh, for sharing your insights on the project with us today. I want to encourage um, on behalf of CFAM to all of you attending this event to keep an eye out for upcoming events. The exhibition opens September 18th. And we have um, exhibition tours with Zach and Robert in the gallery once the exhibition is installed, where we will be able to see in more depth specific objects in the context of the exhibition. So the conversation continues. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful weekend.